Thank you. Good morning, everyone. All right, so uh, as she said, I'll kind of go through a lot of the user research basics, a uh, brief introduction about myself. I've been, um, been a user research manager at Nordisk Games for about three years now. Uh, before this, I was at Paradox Interactive for a couple years, uh, well, a few years actually, uh, working on mostly their strategy games, if you're aware of Paradox Interactive. Before that, I was at 2K Games for a couple years, and then I got my start in the industry at Activision HQ, mainly working on the Call of Duty franchise. Throughout that time, so I've been in doing this for nine plus years, I worked on over 60 video games that have launched uh, all user research. Um, I'll go through kind of the basics, some real life scenarios, encounters that I go through in user research on a regular basis, um, how we conduct it, and there'll be plenty of time at Q&A for questions because everyone's always asking me about war stories, <laughs> questions about specific games and things like that. Um, so yeah, we'll get started. So user research, to kind of sum it up uh, pretty quick, Basically, you want to put your consumer, you're gathering data, you're gathering insights, uh, feedback from your consumers doing some sort of research uh, task. Now, that could be user tests, play tests, um, it could be surveys, it could be some sort of market research, concept testing. There's a long list of ways where you could do user research and tons of different services you could provide and uh, get data from your consumers. But to sum it all up, Basically, the idea is you're gathering data directly from your target audience. So the most common service I've done over the nine years is basically user test and play test. Um, why I differentiate the two. So user test, I like to, it's more usability based. So bringing in a few people to play your game uh, and basically you're picking up all the little things they don't understand or the things where fall apart in your game or things they might not uh, understand right off the bat or can't do, controls, things like that. Playtest is a bit more subjective feedback, so getting the opinions of the players. So they'll play a segment of your game and you're looking for that you know, qualitative feedback, maybe some trends, some opinions from your target audience based on uh, what they think of your game. So how does it start? Basically, the way it works, is I'll start by talking to the devs. It usually is a request, starting with some goals, some basic questions. After that, we go through our database and start recruiting the target audience for the game and bringing those players in. Uh, there's a little bit of preparation as well that goes into that for the study. After that, target audience plays the video game. Data analysis happens, writing, and then report delivery to the game devs and hopefully, and then usually a debrief as well, and hopefully they take that report, they take this nice data, and they make their game better in the process. It's not always the case, I'll talk about this in a future slide, but that's the idea. So, typical pros and cons. Basically, doing user research, you know, you get a user-friendly product, especially if you're doing a lot more user tests and you care about comprehension, accessibility, and things like that. Get happier customers at the end because the game is probably in a spot where you took into account player feedback, and then usually that's gonna lead to more sales, hopefully. Some of the cons, user research can be quite expensive. It depends on how much you wanna do it for your game, uh, how many staff user researchers you want on your team, if you even can have one. Uh, the amount of time and effort it takes. Uh, time is a key thing as well. I've worked with a lot of experienced devs where they don't take into account the time of having user research as part of the product pipeline. So not necessarily working a full agile thing where they know they're doing user research, they're gonna get a report, it's gonna tell them what's wrong with their game in the current state, but not setting up the time after that to basically go and fix those changes. Usually it's like, no, we're going to the next milestone, now we'll do what we can along the way. Usually doesn't turn out well. Um, so planning, huge part of it. Um, and then learning curve. And a lot of people that I've worked with in devs, uh, there's a huge learning curve when it comes to user research. I've worked with devs who've had no experience with user research or don't even know what it is. Uh, and kind of getting into that and getting in the mindset that you're gonna make your game 
alongside your players, alongside your target audience, because you're hopefully making the game for them, so you sell as many units, and also user reviews are really good. And it's a huge learning curve for those who don't have experience. And I've worked with devs who've, you know, old days, PlayStation, Xbox, they've instilled it in the early days, so they know how to use user research, and they're really easy to work with because they know how it works, but I've worked with devs where there is that learning curve, and it does take time to include it in your product pipeline. So, some real life scenarios. <laughs> uh, number one blocker I have experienced, or negative encounter I've experienced in the game industry, out of all the games I've worked with, out of all the devs I've worked with, is ego. <laughs> and it's usually from the creative director, or someone in leadership, someone in the management team. Uh, they have the perspective that they know best. <laughs> Uh, I will give them a report that literally says everything that's wrong with their game and they don't want to listen. Next thing you know, a year and a half later, game is exactly what I told them it was going to be <laughs> when they launch. Um, you, this, this is the number one because this still happens today. Uh, honestly, it's not something that just uh, has happened for me in the past. It still happens today. I won't call out specific products because I think I won't do that openly. <laughs> but. Uh, but this is still the number one thing that happens, is there's usually someone at the top in leadership and ego does get in the way. They think they know best. They're still relying on gut feelings. There's these old school game directors that think they know best. They know great design. Um, but then as they do user research, I'm telling them, well, you kind of don't know great design. Your players are saying otherwise. And they don't really want to listen. Uh, so gut feelings, things like that, or not even believing the data. I've presented a game director a report and saying everything that's wrong with the current build and they just like completely ignore it or don't even believe it and continue moving forward on making the game. Happens way more often than you think. What usually happens? Product launch fails. Uh, user reviews are bad, probably Metacritic as well, and sales are really poor. Uh, the next, I would say the most often a uh, negative encounter I have in my time uh, you know, doing user research for devs is the time and money aspect. Um, usually talking with the producer or the product manager and the game director, usually I'll have scenarios where game director maybe wants a ton of user research, but production sees it as a hindrance. They don't really want to plan it because it takes a lot of t planning involved, the time it takes, the money it takes to do user research. It's not necessarily just a simple thing. Granted, so I believe these producers, uh, honestly, I don't really hold anything against producers or product managers when this comes up because uh, you know, sometimes the game has certain goals and certain milestones that it needs to meet, so you do what you can as part of the process because you're trying to meet a launch date. And this is obviously for like the bigger products who need to hit those milestones, who need to hit that deadline. Uh, and that's usually what happens. It leads to lack of commitment, hesitation, excuses. Uh, we'll do it two months from now. Don't worry. We'll get it in the player's hands. I just don't want them to see this build yet. It's not that great. Like, all right, we'll wait. And then it usually never happens. Or there's not enough money, but there's always money, especially if you're working in AAA or AA, there's money. <laughs> so uh, made up excuses and things like that. Eventually, next thing you know, product launch comes barely did any user research or none at all, and game fails, basically. The number one best encounter I have had in this industry, usually someone in leadership, management, creative director, uh, product manager, someone up there uh, who's leading the team, uh, they want consumer data, they want that feedback, they want to hear from the players, they want to hear what they have to say, what they think about the game. Uh, either because they have experience with user research already or they're this kind of person coming in who know that data is important at some point. Talking to your consumers is important at some point. Um, and usually what that leads to is a lot of user research, gather data, implement, rinse and repeat all the way to the launch of the product. And those games that I've worked on, great product launches, praise from consumers, user reviews are great, lots of sales, money's coming in, uh, and those have been the best projects. Just to put it in perspective, uh, like I said in the beginning, I've worked on over 60 launch video games. There's only five that have done this out of the 60 <laughs> that, that I've worked on. 
So to kind of put it in perspective, like getting user research into your pipeline and the talks and what it takes and the effort, especially for developers. If you're a developer, think about this stuff. Like, are you making this game for yourself or are you making it for people because you want them to have fun? Then you should probably test it with your consumer. So I wrote a few takeaways to just kind of the whole overall talk. So kind of thing, play test, try no matter what to get your product in front of the consumer. Super early as well, I try to convince devs even before vertical slice. Like just testing your three C's, character, controls, camera, like just those basics is gonna be hugely important going down the road. So testing super early, even if it's just white box texting, um, do it for sure. Uh, it'll definitely make a difference later. So I put a few key kind of milestones in here. Um, if you can't do a lot of user research, Five key points I think you should do it is vertical slice, pre-alpha, alpha, pre-beta, alpha, pre and beta. If you can only do like five user research things, these are the places you should do it. Uh, target audience. So I've worked with a lot of devs that think they know their target audience, but they don't really know their target audience or they're figuring it out along the way when it comes to doing user research. So be sure you know who your target audience is and test with them. Um, I've worked with a lot of devs where the mistake is they want to test with everybody and you should not do that. And the reason you should not do that is because here's the thing. If you're going to gather player data and let's, uh, here's an example. Let's say you're making an open world RPG versus a linear RPG. But you're bringing in the linear RPG people to give you feedback on your game. Their feedback is going to be different versus people who prefer open world RPG, so you want to tailor and where you're gathering your feedback and data, uh, making sure you're making the game for that target audience specifically. Otherwise, you're going to probably create your mechanics and systems for an audience that doesn't care. Uh, bias, so in conducting UR, if you're conducting it yourself, uh, just be, uh, try to just be conscious about being biased look at the overall picture, step back, look at everything um, from an object objective standpoint. Um, you want to try to get away from being biased and thinking things are this way versus another way and just keeping an open mind. Uh, humility, so I mentioned ego earlier. Try to, try to leave ego at the door um, when doing user research. Uh, be open to feedback from your consumers. I mean, Ideally, out of all the devs I worked for, the key thing they told me, but didn't really follow through, is they said they wanted to sell this game and players to love it to as many as possible. But they avoided thinking about this and user research and taking it seriously. So they had this goal in mind to, as many players, I want them all to love it, but no follow through. Uh, analytics, I didn't talk too much, but I always get a question about analytics. Um, analytics are great. If you have in-game telemetry, that's great. Uh, one thing to consider with analytics, though, is that's the what. It's not the why. Uh, you can definitely make assumptions and theories based off that data, but those are just assumptions and theories. So take it a little bit step further. Do user research and get the why of why those numbers are why people are playing your game that way. Thank you. All right, questions. <laughs> any, anybody have any questions? Yes, okay. Uh, up there, please. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, um, so what are some of the things that user research can address about a game and some of the things that it can? Because if I'm thinking of like game launches and games, often it seems like pretty structural, major things about the game that are wrong. And is that something user research can actually address, like the major structural things about the game? So, if you're thinking early, like I talked about, one thing, uh, one sort of service you could think about doing is concept testing. If you're unaware or unsure of your market or not knowing who the game you're making it for, um, one thing you could start out is concept testing. So basically, you know how you make a pitch for your game? Breakdown, it's probably the pillars, who you're going to sell to, et cetera, et cetera, and probably some key art, overall picture of your game on paper. What you want to do that is put it, that in front of consumers and see what they think and say. 
that at least you're in the early stage, you haven't built anything yet, and just get an idea and kind of get almost an analysis of where the market is right now. It's like, let's say, let's say you wanted to make a, a story-driven action-adventure game. Okay, what's the market think right now about story, uh, linear story-driven action-adventure games? Um, because it might be different than what you think maybe five years ago. Maybe you have a perspective, but the market has a different perspective. So those are things you could do early. That way you could, okay, I now learned about this, the market. I now know how I want to tweak my pitch. I know what the pillars. I know that these mechanics suck to players. They hate them. These are the ones they really like. So this is what I'm going to build around. Um, and that pre-intelligence can help a long way towards where you want to make your game. So that's something you could consider in the like, very foundation structuring wise. Yeah. Said, yeah, we got some feedback from parents that it wasn't that well received, so we'll, we'll get it you know, next time in a year's time that we, we might do updates or something. I'm like, okay, so what, what is your plan for testing? I said, oh, you'll be the one tester. Like, I was the one design department to that whole thing. And yeah. I said, oh, okay, I'm, you know, I dove into a bunch of resources for it, but it was really hard to eventually convince them that there's going to be huge benefits to it, even if we're a small startup, to um, yeah, to really commit to doing more research before you go to launch, not stumble your way through the feedback after the fact. Right. I think the it's hard to find success stories because the thing about user research, it's kind of one thing I don't like about my peers or the industry in general when it comes to user research, is no one wants to talk about how shitty the game was <laughs> during development and how great it got to the end. So that's kind of a problem with my, uh, with my peers in my industry. I would love to tell those stories, but we're like hard on NDAs and talking about the product and development and how bad it was and things like that. So it's a bit rough material out there for successes. Is not, there's not a lot of it, but like the one that's semi-public is, for instance, the first God of War 2018, not the newest one, Ragnarok. Uh, they spent $4 million on user research for God of War, and they did it all the time. <laughs> and that game, mass critic success, mass consumer success, lots of sales, and they changed that franchise. If you played the older God of Wars, it's definitely not like how God of War is today. So they took a huge chance, and a lot of people think like, oh my god, they took a huge chance reinventing the game. No, they didn't. They tested with their consumers what they wanted today. They spent $4 million bringing in a bunch of people during development to figure out that this is what the market wanted today. So that's kind of that behind the scenes of, they didn't really take a chance. They were doing risk assessment and analysis the whole time they were making that game with the consumers. Can you get into user research as a Yeah, I mean, uh, as long as, so when it comes to user research and if this is something you want to do, um, you have to love people. <laughs> You're going to be working with people all the time, so that's like one thing you should be aware of. But I think anybody can get into it at any point. A lot of it is basic logistics, uh, production things, scheduling, planning. Um, there's lots of material online of how to work with users, how to maintain being unbiased, uh, how to uh, ask questions. So I think the most difficult part probably about getting in is learning methodology and how to conduct studies in a proper way. So you're going to get some clean data back. That's probably going to be the most difficult thing. But if you could get past that, then most of it is um, pretty standard stuff. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. That completely put me off, like, listening to your research. But I don't know if there's, like, a difference or something. So, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, so, when I do hire and I look for people, I do get a lot of PhD candidates, master thesis candidates. Um, and there's the academic way of doing things, and then there's the industry, corporate way of doing things. So I think if you're coming from academics, the thing I tell them is like, 
You learned a lot of good stuff, probably foundational things, and that's going to be great. But dump all the aspects of time, money, how, like, logistics. Uh, you're going to want to ask the questions that the company really matters. And the thing is, academic, though, like, it's very time consuming, and it does take a lot of money. So that's, like, the difference. I do a play test where I get the build and I deliver a report within eight business days. Versus academic, you're gonna go through all these procedures, <laughs> you're gonna go through this like real timeline, make sure everything's perfect, and you know, we have to be very scientific about it. That goes out the window. Uh, <laughs> you obviously wanna maintain the unbiased stuff. Um, you're gonna keep the foundation of research, but that's the stuff that goes out the window. You're gonna wanna have to be, you're gonna learn to be, adapt, be very agile, and just kinda do things on a faster pace. And a lot of that stuff you just kinda throw away. So I would say like those are the key differences. Yeah. Yes? I have a question about using analytics versus player service. So like, let's say you, you would have a situation in which like alpha testing went pretty well, but you go into open beta, and it turns out that the player like, so I've worked with live games where you like maybe want to do a closed alpha or something like that and then go to beta and things like that I think if you're gonna put your game out even like let's say early access is a big thing today right everyone's pretty much like if you don't have money uh, you got your game in a pretty decent spot you need some flux you're probably gonna put in early access and that's not necessarily a bad thing um, the probably the most useful thing you need to do is create a survey for those players that are playing either in your closed alpha or beta or whatever. I see a lot of devs drop the ball on that. They don't have a survey ready for the players who are gonna enter their game. Maybe leave, maybe come back. You don't know what's gonna happen, but at least they're gonna answer the survey and you're gonna get some of the opinions of those players playing your game. Because um, one thing I think they rely on is only telemetry data they probably have in place or maybe um, some analytics they have in place only, but not actually asking the players or getting the why like I talked about earlier. So that's one thing I would do um, in those situations is definitely have a survey ready. And the types of questions you want to ask is like, you kind of want to be forward in a sense when answering, asking your questions. So like, just ask him, do you want to continue playing? Do you not want to continue playing? What do you hate about this game? What do you like about this game? Um, and that'll give you a picture Kind of just like those basic questions alone will give you a picture of like, okay, I just put my game out there. This is what people think. Where do I pivot from here? Kind of thing. Yeah. Yes? Uh, tracking data while players are uh, playing the game, is that a part of user research as well? Like seeing the statistics, hey, this user is doing this thing all the time. Yeah. Is that a part of your goal as well? It depends. Um, at the bigger companies I've worked at, um, it, there's a whole umbrella, and it's like insights, so it's data analytics and user research. So the bigger companies, it's like whole department, and everyone's under it. Uh, smaller companies, usually those departments are not really under the same umbrella, but they're maybe there, or one or the other is there, not both. Um, I don't really work with that stuff, that's more analytics-based telemetry, but if I do have access to it, or there is a department at the company, then I'm usually bumping shoulders with that department and getting a little bit of info. Or they're bumping me because they're like, there's these crazy numbers, but I don't know why. Can you figure out why? Uh, can you talk a little bit about if, if you have like a really small team, like three to five people, like um, where should they have uh, limited resources? Yeah. Like what would be the important part that where? Yeah, I think, it's tricky, but I think the key thing is, here's the thing, with user testing, you only need to bring in three to six people to play your game. Make sure it's from the target audience, of course, like who you're making it for, but you only need to bring three to six per study. And you don't, you're not focused on frequency, how many times things went wrong for a player. With those kind of smaller studies, everything is wrong with your game. <laughs> so obviously there's gonna be higher frequency stuff, let's say, blah, 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 player, tutorial, they didn't understand this text and blah, blah, didn't understand how to do this mechanic. That, and that happened like 10 times, whatever. 
versus something that happened one time to a player. You don't think of things that way. Everything is a checklist that you should kind of go through and handle. That's specifically user test. So, and that is the easiest because also all you're doing is bringing in a player and watching them play your game. That's like the most simplest thing you could do. Um, and obviously, stay as hands off as possible. Here's another thing I see devs <laughs> kind of mess up on. They want to help the player, or they tell me to help the player, or go in there, they're doing it wrong, they're playing the game wrong. I'm like, they're not playing the game wrong. They are playing the game that you built, <laughs> and you did something wrong. It's never the player's fault. If, uh, and that's, that's something that always happens with usability testing, is the devs always think that the player doesn't know how to play their game. But that's not how life works. <laughs> so, um, but that's like the simplest thing you could do. And then you could eventually upgrade to bigger studies like 10 plus, and then gather subjective stuff, like actually asking them, what do you like about the game? What do you dislike about the game? Were there any confusing parts? Um, what would you like to see added to the game? And what do you think about the game overall? Those are like the basic five things you could do. And then you take that sample of 10 or more and kind of compile it and see, OK, here's some things I know I could change. And that one's more based on frequency. So you want to, like, if 10 out of 10 are saying this, then you want to address that, essentially. Yes? Uh, so I have two questions. Uh, one is, how do you like, uh, find the target audience? And then, uh, what kind of data should you collect from telemetry? Because I've seen, like, at least, with micro people are like hating on telemetry, like don't like it at all. <laughs> sure. So, finding your target audience. Oh man. Okay, that's like the toughest thing probably to do uh, when conducting any sort of research or making a game in general. Honestly, it's like it's still the toughest thing to do. A lot of AAA games, you probably see it all the time. They advertise their game. It still happens today. They advertise their game a specific way. They say their game is X, Y, Z. They think this is who their target audience is. Next thing you know, the game launch. Everybody hates it because they said it was this, but it's not this. And next thing you know, it's bad. Um, so it's still tough today. But there are probably a few key things you could try and do. Um, basically, what you want to focus on first is what are your closest competitors? Now, that's not necessarily going to be easy to do, especially if you're indie and you're doing something new or reinventing the wheel. It's going to be a bit tougher because there's probably another game that is not doing a mechanic or system that you put in your game. But you, what you want to do is at least bring in people who've played the games closest to your game first and then see if it resonates with them. And if it doesn't, then you got to start looking elsewhere and start testing with adjacent markets and adjacent consumers. And you kind of just keep testing until there's an audience that actually does like your game. Now, if you're testing, testing, testing in multiple audiences and they all don't like it, then you probably really need to, need to relook at your game and change something into it. If there's a lot of consumers out there that are just not liking your game, it's probably something they don't want. Um, and that's just the cold, hard facts about it. Um, so just keep testing with different markets, see who it resonates with, and that's probably going to be the easiest. Now, keep in mind, if you change something drastic in your game during development, or you take out a feature, it's not there anymore, you decide, oh, it's going to be too tough, I don't want to do this anymore, I'm taking that out, you're going to have to retest again, because that one small change your target audience probably changed as well because they probably liked that feature and now you took it out. So just be considerate of those things. Yeah. You could do market research. It's very expensive. Uh, if you have like anywhere between forty dollars to $80,000, you could probably get a market research report on a specific market and knowing what they like and dislike about a specific genre. Um, but obviously, that's, that's if you have money. Or if you have an investor who has market data or access to market data. Any other questions? Yes. Um, so I have a question about sound Yeah. What's a good, um, you know, yeah. Sure. Is it more than that? Yeah. What's a good, good number? No, good question. Three to six for usability. So just comprehension, basics, controls, things like that. And you're just watching the player, seeing what they don't understand, and see where they maybe get stuck and stuff like that. So three to six. 
Um, 10 is what I tell devs if you just want a checkup or a checkpoint. Enough to get subjective data. It's just a simple checkup. It's fast. It's dirty. But at least you know what direction to go from there. Uh, I tell devs 16 if you want a little extra data that's leaning towards bits case. I tell them basically 16 if you're looking to make decisions that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. I tell them 30 plus if they're making million dollar decisions like I'm going to delay my game. I'm going to take out this feature. <laughs> I am going to uh, completely redesign something because I don't think this is working 30 plus. So 10 checkups, 16, $100,000 decisions, you know, you know, they're going to cost money, but not a lot of money. 30 plus if you're going to make some million dollar plus decisions about your game. Yeah. It's kind of how I literally pitch it to devs. Any other questions? Um, yes. Yeah, the target group. So the easiest way, honestly, the easiest, ship, cheapest way is you can recruit through kind of one of your inner circles, friends, family, secondary, maybe not close personal, like first degree, at least second, third degree. Um, but give them a survey on like the type of games they're playing, what do they play on a regular basis. And that's fine to do. You know, if you want to be cheap, don't have a lot of money. The idea here, like I mentioned earlier, though, is only bring in the people that you're targeting that market. So when they do that screener survey that you made, like the type of genres they play, the game specifically that they play, have they played this game, how much of the games have they played, then you bring in those people that you're making the game for and kind of leave out the people who are not the target audience from the screener that you sent out. That's probably, that's like the easiest way to go about it. Then you, could, if you want to get bigger numbers, you could resort to social channels, Facebook, Instagram, things like that. Put that screener online in some capacity, and hopefully you get upwards of 100 locally that you could start testing with. Uh, depending on your game, you might want to consider, let's say you want to go full board, user research. I want to know what my players think from beginning to end. A good, solid number of players to have, like the exact target audience would probably be around 300. Um, it's going to give you enough new players. It's going to give you enough returning players uh, to work with with a database. So at least 300, I would say, I think like that. Cool. Any other questions? I could talk about games I've worked on and then see if you have any questions. So Call of Duty franchise I mentioned. Two favorite games I've ever worked on in my industry is Civilization VI and XCOM 2. Worked on Mafia 3, Evolve, Battleborn, the Borderlands franchise. Uh, let's see. Dark Anthologies currently with Supermassive, so if you love horror games. Uh, the Hunter Call of the Wild, Paradox, pretty much all that stuff. Crusader Kings 3, a lot of that strategy. Bracket. So if you have a specific question about any of those specific games I've done user research on, I'll be happy to talk about that as well. Cool. Yes. Have you worked on Stellaris? Yes, I worked on Stellaris. So I am not a, str a strategy gamer at all, but I honestly love the game. So it's really, really easy for me. Yes, it is easy if you are a strategy gamer. If you're not super into strategy, it's definitely difficult. That's something I learned. But yeah, Stellaris is a great game. I had a lot of fun working on that. I actually worked on the console edition. We didn't think that was going to be possible. But it is. It's a slower pace, but apparently it was possible to make for players. Yes? Is testing with multiplayer exponentially more difficult than single player? Oh my god, yes. <laughs> Yeah. You get loot and who gets what, and you can either decide, like, oh, there's a nice way to do it, or tough luck. You were slower, you don't get the thing that you wanted. Yeah. The, I would say the two toughest genres I've worked on have been multiplayer games and uh, open world games. So Mafia 3 and Borderlands were really tough. Um, and Mafia is you know, your typical GTA open world drive, do whatever you want. And doing user research on that game is a freaking nightmare. <laughs> 
uh, especially if you're trying to get the player to play as much of the game as possible. Um, but yeah, multiplayer, that takes a lot of logistical work in the lab, like having enough PC set up, is the network gonna be up and running? Multiplayer probably has the most prep work, I would say, when doing user research. You wanna make sure everything works and runs before you even consider bringing players in. Otherwise, like I've had, in my early days, I would just kind of plan and hope the devs deliver me something uh, that works. And never think that way, by the way. User research, that was my early days, the mistakes were made. Never believe the dev is gonna give you something that just works. <laughs> uh, I usually ask for builds really early now, like a pre-build and then the final build that we're working for playtesting, just to make sure what, uh, I know what type of train wreck I'm walking into, and I know all the debug settings, and I know how to get around specific things, so that way the player can have a smooth experience. But yeah, it's completely different. Especially with open world, uh, a lot of the time, if you want the players to see most of the content in those games, I do kind of have to go in there and kind of tell them, can you please do this story mission now? Um, because maybe they're just roaming around just killing pedestrians in the street <laughs> for like 20 minutes. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, go for it. Oh, yeah, go for it. Uh, how did you conduct your research for the Yeah, so I uh, do that one at Nordisk Games since Supermassive is part of our portfolio. Uh, so that one's actually kind of tough because uh, Supermassive, they have a history with user research and they've been doing it basically kind of since they existed and working with Sony and stuff, and Sony has their own lab. Um, they like a lot of players to play their games. So, and it's linear, there's lots of branching, but honestly, with that game, you just kind of simplify it. You're just bringing people in, and they're gonna play through the game uh, their own way. And, like early, early testing, Usually it's only one branch that's working, so everyone's playing the same storyline, no matter what. Later though, it's multiple branching, multiple storylines. Um, so what you gotta do is kinda logistically think about what matters. Is it the overall experience? Do the devs actually care about what branch they go down? Um, sometimes, a lot of the time, it's just play the game, see how they play, and what do they think about the game overall. And the thing about Supermass is the way they make those games is there are little things they could do still towards the end. Um, they might not be able to change the story too much or the overall experience because it's like mocap. That game is, the game is made in a specific way. They mocap everything. They put it in. And it's a very expensive process. So kind of changing things is kind of out of the question, like major things. But the way they built their engine is they could still add little scares here or fix something the player maybe didn't understand. Or maybe the player didn't spot this specific item and they want them to see this item and they put it in a different place and stuff like that. So just those little things can make all the difference if you're making a very linear story-driven game. Like don't think, crap, my game sucks, people are disliking it, not having a good time, don't really know why, but they're frustrated with these things. There's probably still some things you could do. Little tweaks make all the difference. There's like the Max Payne story. Max Payne was just a typical third person shooter like any other third person shooter. And they invented bullet time at the very last minute and then it became one of the most awesome third person action games ever made. Like that was like a last minute game design decision that made that game sell millions of units. So it's not always dead, there's something you can do. And I've seen it happen plenty of times working on tons of games. Yes? How did you get into <laughs> I kind of fell into it. So I went to college for game design. Uh, so I know how to make a game. I know how to work in Unreal Engine. Uh, assets, you know, the basics. I got out uh, thinking that I was going to get a job in the industry right away. That did not happen. <laughs> uh, so I started applying to every entry level position around me, anything, literally anything. Uh, and then I got an interview for Activision as this user research moderator. I didn't know what the hell it was. Honestly, I forgot the job that I applied to. I was like, I don't know what this job is. I went in, I did the interview, talked about games. Uh, they could see I was very passionate about games, that I played a ton of games. 
I pretty much shat on Call of Duty in my interview saying this game hasn't been good in a very long time. Uh, <laughs> and next thing you know, a week later, they're like, you're hired. So <laughs> that's how I got, then that's how I learned user research. I got a lot of foundational learning working on a AAA product in user research. A lot of my knowledge was just sponged from Activision when I was there. Yeah. That's how I got started. Shitting on Call of Duty in an interview. <laughs> yes. So uh, we actually have sign up Nordis Games booth out there, uh, but you can go to nordisgames.com and we have a playtest sign up um, and our labs here in Copenhagen. Uh, we're doing playtest almost once every two, three weeks. So we do a lot of screeners that we send out to people. Uh, so you can sign up to our database. Uh, keep an eye out for your email when you sign up. Um, and yeah, that's the easy way. We're also doing a raffle. So if you sign up through there, we'll be giving out uh, gift cards for winners in the coming week as well. So, but that's how you sign up. And a lot of, I know, the, probably the next biggest studio in the area that does a lot of play testing is going to be Ubisoft Malmo. So if you're willing to take a train ride <laughs> to go to Malmo, they do a lot of user research there that you could sign up for as well. Any other questions? We got two minutes, I think, right? Yeah. Good. All right. Thank you very much. I'll be around. So if you want to just come up to me, have a one-on-one, -on -one, or talk games, or user research, feel free to come up to me. Don't be shy. Cool.